Thank you, Paul, for that overly generous introduction. The first words are uh, sometime between 1837 and 1839, John Snow drowned a guinea pig. I did not write those words. I'm the third of five authors. Don't give it all to me. This was written by Steve Rackman. The book actually published in 2003, and it's available upstairs, was a collaboration between five people from very different disciplines. I was really the only epidemiologist. Steve is actually a professor of English interested in states of uh, unconsciousness in the 19th century, and that's how he came to snow. We all come to snow in different ways. I was, uh, the, 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 I was just, one anecdote came to me yesterday by a strange happenstance meeting in London, the circumstances of which are beyond this, but I learned that uh, of, 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 of how broad the reach of epidemiology is when I learned that in sometime in the late 1940s, two... Uh, Cambridge undergraduates attended the May Ball, which I understand is a big thing at Cambridge, the May Ball. Uh, the male uh, uh, part of the date was Geoffrey Rose. Familiar name in London? Uh, the female member was Margaret Roberts, later to be Margaret Roberts Thatcher. Did you know that Geoffrey Rose dated Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> I, I learned this on good authority yesterday. <laughs> So uh, today I'm going to try to give you a picture of snow in, in sort of three parts. Part one is uh, a, bio a little bit of biographical sketch, his family, where he came from, what he did. Part two is what his science was, and part three is where I'm going to kind of leap a little bit and try to convince you that snow was really singular in at least two ways. One, that uh, his, his work was really quite unique. Uh, people we're not doing what he was doing at the time. He was singular. And in another way, I think there's an overarching theme to Snow's work that actually has been hinted at in some of the words we've heard already by Paul, but I think really uh, is, uh, 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 gives his work coherence and uh, is very useful for us to understand. So there are only three existing pictures of Snow from his life. Uh, a portrait, a bust, and a photograph. The photograph, what strikes me about the photograph always, this is the one that's most widely used, is the size of his hands and fingers that hint at the kind of uh, family he came from. He came from a family uh, of farmers and laborers. Uh, his, uh, he was born in the city of York, uh, probably the first urban birth in his family in a long time, the first of nine children of two uh, people who grew up on farms, William Snow and Fanny Ascom. Fanny Ascom, his mother, was actually born out of wedlock and could not, uh, by law, take her father's name, even though her parents married when she was three. So all her younger siblings had a different surname, which made family tracking difficult. She was the only Ascom. Her uh, other siblings were called Emson, which was her father's name. They both came from little farming villages outside York. And, but we do know that they were both literate, which was atypical at the time. And uh, on the parish records, which lists all of the nine Snow children, they were all born in York, uh, William Snow was listed as a laborer on the first six, and he was elevated to carman for the last three. It was a very upwardly mobile family. Upward mobility in the early 19th century is a fascinating topic, uh, how people uh, came off the farms and out of the factories and into... Uh, middle-class professions like medicine. The Snows were in there. We know that by the 1840s, William Snow, born on a farm, a laborer, was actually collecting rent on four properties in York, and that he had purchased a farm uh, uh, in the village of Rockcliffe, just outside York. Uh, here is what happened to what we know of Snow's eight siblings. Uh, 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 of the nine children, eight survived to adulthood, which is extraordinary for the early 19th century, particularly in a laboring family. Uh, William, the second eldest, ran a temperance hotel. Temperance is a theme in Snow's life and in his family. We'll talk more about that. We don't know what happened to Charles. Robert was a colliery manager. Thomas uh, was a minister of some note, uh, became vicar of Underbarrow. Uh, his two sisters, uh, Mary and Hannah, who survived to the 20th century, uh, founded and directed the Mount School for Girls. Uh, I've seen an advertisement for it in the Yorkshire Intelligence or whatever the name of the... The, the journal is there. Only Sarah, uh, the baby sister, married a farmer and kind of maintained that kind of family tradition of farming. And the only one who died was George, the last born in infancy. 
These are what it looked like. These are the villages surrounding York. They're now all part of York, the walled city in the center to which the Snows migrated. Upper Poppleton in the left, uh, which was the home of William Snow. This is doing anything. Uh, Huntington, uh, that's where uh, his mother grew up. Uh, Acom, where they married, where his, uh, Fanny's, uh, Fanny Snow's parents married. This is where uh, William Snow bought a farm. This is where Sarah Snow went to marry. You see this village culture of Yorkshire, uh, very strong, I think, in Snow's background. Uh, this is All Saints Church, North Street, York, where Snow was, uh, 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 which Snow's family attended, and its parish register contains all the Snow children, and its churchyard has the graves of Snow's paternal grandparents and infant brother, George. Snow left school at 14. If you read the way he writes, you would recommend that everybody should leave school at 14. He was, uh, 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 did not let lack of an education get in, in, into the way of in the way of learning. And he, he was apprenticed. That was the way he became a doctor in those days. He was apprenticed first to William Hardcastle of Newcastle, not far from New York, and other practitioners in the surrounding countryside for a period of at least five or six years. And he was able to take some medical school courses. You could take courses. It wasn't essential for you to become a physician, but you could. And then he went to London, on foot, interestingly enough, uh, for further training, enrolling in the Windmill Street Medical School that was founded by John Hunter, the famous surgeon. And uh, then uh, he became certified uh, by his, the experience that he'd had and by examination as a surgeon apothecary. The surgeon apothecaries were the general practitioners of the day. They generally did not go to medical school, as ha Snow had not done uh, until then. And uh, then, by examination, examination that none of us could pass, uh, I can assure you, uh, he was certified as MD from the University of London, including, you, you spoke about uh, Major Greenwood. He had to translate from the French and the Latin. He had to know uh, biology of reptiles. He had to know an extraordinary number of things. And uh, he did. He placed very, very high in the examinations. And then he became MD, which was the highest echelon available. So he, he, he climbed up this ladder by dint of effort. Uh, he had a helpful uncle, Charles Empson. We couldn't work out the relationship for a long time until we discovered this Askham Empson problem, that his mother's sisters, uh, brothers had different names from her. But Charles Empson was another uh, striver. He, uh, uh, he lived in Bath, and when Snow walked to London, he went through Bath to visit his uncle Charles. He was a, actually a successful antiques dealer, originally in Newcastle. And the important thing about uh, Empson was he seemed to be part of intellectual and philosophical circles, the Newcastle Philosophical Society, and uh, particularly, for example, the Stevenson family, the developers of the steam engine, George and Robert, father and son. Uh, and in fact, Empson went to South America to prospect for gold and silver with uh, Robert Stevenson. Uh, and another link is that George Stevenson uh, and Snow, they may have met, but they were linked because they were both involved in the Killington Colliery outside of Newcastle, where actually George Stevenson developed his first steam engine to transport snow, and where Snow was caring for miners in the 1831-32 epidemic. Uh, first epidemic of cholera in Europe, and uh, that colliery was kind of that was a medical care assignment to Hardcastle, Snow's mentor. Uh, we think that Snow, uh, that Empson paid some of his medical school tuition, maybe even the fee you had to pay to be apprenticed. You had to pay a fee to become an apprentice, and uh, more importantly, perhaps he introduced Snow to some scientific literary, and perhaps interestingly enough, engineering circles. These Stevensons came from a similar background, rural. Stevenson, George, the father, his parents were illiterate, and he learned to read at the age of 18. This developer is Stevenson. He learned to read at the age of 18. The, the amazing achievements of some of these working class people uh, uh, who became great scientific th thinkers is really quite astonishing to contemplate. Uh, Snow really began as a general practitioner in London. His practice was largely among the poor for a number of reasons. He didn't seem to be the kind of doctor who could make it with the upper class. As, uh, the Harley Street specialist was not for him. He was kind of evidence-based. He didn't kind of give in to what the, pa the patient wanted. And we think his Yorkshire accent was very strong. He was, it was said that he was difficult to understand in London because of his accent. Uh, as you'll learn, he steadily increased his time devoted to anesthesia. 
He became, in fact, uh, financially quite comfortable from his anesthetic practice. We think he earned, or at least uh, his biographer records uh, that he, uh, his original biographer, Benjamin Ward Richardson, in the 19th century, brief biography, uh, that he earned maybe up to a thousand pounds a year. Not rich, but comfortable. Um, he, but the most interesting feature of his life was that he was such a dedicated scientist, he never stopped attending medical society meetings, uh, presenting scientific papers, particularly at the London Medical Society, also known as the London, earlier as the London and Westminster Medical Society. And he never, there was not a single year between his medical school and his death that he didn't publish or, or present papers and at least twice a year, perhaps usually much more than that, even though he had no, nothing to support him except his practice, nothing at all. And everything he did for cholera, he was doing privately. He was not assigned to do it. He was not asked to do it. Uh, he did it himself, and, and he even took time off from his anesthesia practice to do his cholera investigations. We know that because his case books were published, and we can see where his practice dropped on the days we knew he had to have been uh, investigating in Broad Street and elsewhere. He never married. Um, he was brought up in a deeply religious environment, we think. We have some evidence for that. But there's nothing in his writings at all. He, in this, he's quite distinctly different from a number of sanitarians. There is no moral complaint. There is no those, those dissolute poor people, those drunk, none of this. No morality and no religion can you find in any of his writings. Uh, he also had, and this prefigures much of his work, he carefully regulated from a very young age his intake. <coughs> he, uh, first of all, he took a temperance pledge. He didn't take alcohol until his later years when it was medically advised that he take alcohol. He became a vegetarian. John Snow was a lifelong vegetarian. You veg veggie folks in the audience will not just keep in mind that he died young, but still, <laughs> nonetheless, had, I'm sure it had nothing to do with it. And he even distilled his own drinking water, extraordinarily enough. Uh, this is all long before he had his cholera theories published. We learned after we published that he was fined five pounds, which was a lot of money in those days, as a teenager for setting off a firecracker, I think you call it a firework, perhaps, uh, outside a church during services. We have no idea what this means. Was it an anti-clerical demonstration, a childhood prank, accident, was it the wrong guy? We don't know, but he had to pay his five pounds. It's probably the, perhaps the most exciting personal thing he ever did, actually, uh, outside of science. <laughs> Anesthesia. He, you know, he, he, he was not Mr. Personality and Excitement, I don't think. I, I don't get that impression. Anesthesia. Uh, there's, it's an extraordinary story. We, we celebrate his epidemi epidemiology and his color, and I never knew much about his anesthesia work until we began, the group of us, to really look at his writings. And I must tell you, he absolutely is extraordinary in what he did for anesthesia is what he did for epidemiology. And I think we should mention that a bit. He, uh, the, 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 the second demonstration of anesthesia in England, actually it's the second, I learned this, took place around the corner on Gower Street, as uh, Paul well knows. Uh, a, a dental surgeon whose house is also commemorated named Robinson showed this as a wonderful story, a letter. This is how fast science moved. In October 1846, in Boston, Massachusetts, there uh, was conducted the famous demonstration at what they now call the Ether Dome. You can visit it at the Mass General Hospital in Boston. I've been there. And the first, an extraction of a tooth was shown. The person given ether. They took out the tooth. He woke up. What's, you know, he's happy. He didn't feel any pain. It was astonishing, like a, an amazing parlor trick. And, and a letter was sent to a man named Francis Booth, an American doctor working in London, like Paul. And he received, uh, he received the letter, and he arranged Within two months, they were demonstrating the same thing in London in December 1846. And what's most extraordinary is that by the end of 1847, within a year, Snow wrote on the inhalation of vapor of ether in surgical operations, which was the complete how-to manual of how to do anesthesia, didn't need improvement until the 1920s. Basically laid out all the science, all of what you had to do. Uh, he experimented with animals. We don't know where but we know he experimented with lots of little animals, chaffinches, frogs, rodents, himself sometimes, uh, looking at the effects of different anesthetics. And uh, he would began to provide anesthesia and uh, to develop methods for safe and effective anesthesia. His book, actually it's a show monograph, solved four problems. 
First of all, how do you mix the anesthetic gas and air so, you get, so you, the person doesn't asphyxiate from not getting enough air? Uh, how do you actually get it, the mix, to the patient effectively? How do you monitor the depth of anesthesia? And also, he set the standard for recording cases and their complications, which he would then summarize in his books and his monographs. A clinical epidemiologist there. This is his first apparatus from 1847 in the monograph. Uh, the key things to note is that you have this little tin chamber, and it contains warm water. Why warm water? Because he, he, he recognized, first he recognized, that ether-air mixtures, the percent that is ether varies by temperature. So by keeping a set, a set temperature, he could control the amount of ether in the gas. Uh, the spiral chamber inside facilitate the air, eat the mixing. And the mask, first to use a mask, a face mask, to deliver it. It was often put on a handkerchief and you smelled it, or very, in very uh, unscientific, unmeasurable ways. He made all these contributions within a year of seeing the first demonstration. These were the key principles of anesthesia. And that's why he was so sought after. He was, he was good at it. And he was sought after by the queen. Uh, he actually, uh, he was sent, we know he, he traveled to other parts of England to give anesthesia sometimes, and he twice administered chloroform to Queen Victoria uh, in childbirth in the 1850s. By the way, another thing for which the Lancet, which is now, in today's issue, making apologies for their uh, terrible, terrible attitudes to snow in the 1840s and 50s, uh, uh, excoriated him for putting the Queen's life so at risk in this manner. How could he have? Uh, how did he turn to cholera? That's not so clear, you know. But we do know he was involved in all of the three cholera epidemics of the 19th century, uh, the first three, three pandemics. As I've mentioned before, in 1831, he was really only a teenager, and he was assigned to take care of cholera and the Killington Mind. You can imagine this epidemic hitting Newcastle and... Uh, and Hardcastle, his mentor, saying, I've got to take care of patients. Snow, you go, go take care of the miners. Go over there. So he was personally responsible as a teenager for the epidemic of cholera in the mines. And a lot of his writings refer to the experience of mines. What happens in mines and why mines are a terrible place to be when there's a cholera outbreak. In 1849, he published uh, two works, uh, a monograph and a two-part article uh, that described his basic theory of cholera, which I'll go into in a bit detail, that it was exclusively spread by the fecal oral mode and by extension in water supplies. And they set out, it's important to know that he set out his basic theory in 1849. He never changed it. The bigger edition, which is on display out front, the 1855, only gives you stronger examples and proof of this fundamental notion. So his theory was, he first he reasons he begins with the pathophysiology and the clinical uh, picture, it's entirely a disease of the intestines. No other organ need be invoked. It's, why is it so fatal? Because you lose fluids at a huge amount, rapidly, and you become shocky and you can't sustain your circulation. He knew that. He understood that. Therefore, he said, why should it be inhaled? It should be ingested, whatever causes this. It has to be ingested. And, there has, and he also noticed that the agent, he said, has to be something that can reproduce itself. Why? Because there's a delay between the time of ingestion of, of what was, like, for example, in the Broad Street Pump and the onset of disease. And he thought this was a little cell-like thing. He calls it something having the properties of a cell that was reproducing itself. He called it the special cholera poison. Uh, but he thought it was something like a cell, and it was reproducing itself, and uh, it could cause disease in the next person. And uh, this is 30 years before Koch and Pasteur were talking germ theory. And so the transmission is by the fecal oral route, that is to say, the color evacuations being colorless, water, because it's just massive water output from, uh, in the stool, could contaminate easily lots of things, and you can get into your mouth. And then if it gets into the water supply, all hell will break loose, as it did. And most particularly, this whole preoccupation with foul odors, cesspools, nasty stuff, had nothing to do with cholera. He insisted upon this. This was his strong argument. This was the part that shocked everybody. This is the part. It's the negative part. You mean it's not those terrible that, No, they're fine. They're, they're, I don't like them, but they don't cause these. In fact, we, the one place he got into some... Uh, he, he, kind of, he was careful not to criticize the sanitarians too much, but he did point out that the great project between the two cholera epidemics of 48, 49, and 54, 55 was what? Anybody know what it was? 
It was to empty the cesspools. 10,000 cesspools were emptied. You know, they were under the house, they smelled. They must be causing epidemics. Where were they emptied to? The Thames. For snow, this is making things worse. And he said so. Gently he said so. But, you know, not all public health action is, is, is positive. We have to evaluate it. So the two key pieces, the set pieces of his second edition, were the outbreak near Golden Square, traced to the Broad Street Pump. Thank you, Paul, for saying not in Golden Square, but near Golden Square. Paul is very exact. He teaches me that. And the effect of the two different water supplies in South London, the Southwark and Vauxhall, whose water came from Battersea. That was where the waterworks were. You probably know where that is. And all the sewage of London dripping right into it. And then Lambeth, who had moved their works upstream. By the way, legislation had insisted that this be done, but the date was later than 1855. Lambeth decided to jump the gun. They moved their waterworks upstream early. So you had the early movers upstream, Lambeth, and the, the laggard Southwark and Vauxhall. Uh, this is the map that you see outside, except it's a little bit different because it doesn't have the dotted line. This is the map of how close it is. This is the key piece, one key piece of evidence that Snow said, this is the walking distance to the pump. The miasmatist would, would see a pump in the middle and say, you see, God, well, you know, that's miasma. It diffuses through the air. No, he showed it was the walking distance. Any place inside this, uh, this line, it's a shorter walk to the Broad Street pump than to any other pump. So a point like this, see this, uh, let's see if we can get this. Out here, it seems like a long way away, but you see all these deaths here. It's closer there to a pump at this spot, it's, it's not closer because if you had to walk around a few streets to get to the Broad Street Pump. So he showed that the, that kind of line of walking in, incorporated more cases. And later that came to be called a Voronoi diagram. And he was probably the first, we think, to use this. By the way, this is just a, an artifact, this, long, this big line here of the copying. So this Voronoi di diagram is part of the evidence he found as a uh, 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 Paul has emphasized in his thinking about it, negative and positive evidence, exemption, the percussion cap factory workers, they have their own water supply, the brewery workers, who needs water when you have beer, and uh, the risk to people farther away from the pump, uh, the children who pass by the pump on the way to school, and he established by talking to the families that they had, in fact, the habit of using the pump. Uh, and people who preferred the Broad Street ward, of course, the famous and sad Hampstead widow, who received all her, um, who so loved the Broad Street. She was actually the widow of the percussion cap factory director. And she, you know, they got wealthy. She goes up to Hampstead. She lives there. But she remembered how nice that Broad Street pump water tasted. So she had a schedule, a weekly delivery of pump water. And she, she and her maid were the only two people to die of cholera in Hampstead. You know, drinking that water. So sad, you know, to get attached to a water supply. Uh, the iconic story, Snow removed the handle and the epidemic was stayed. Even Benjamin Ward Richardson, his biography, says this is untrue. I hope everybody knows that. A, he didn't remove the pump. The uh, Board of Guardians removed the pump at his request the following day. And B, here's the curve. You can see this is when the pump handle was removed. Right here. Hardly the cause of the epidemic decline, right? And, and important to know that Snow said this too. Snow was not convinced he did anything. Snow said the flight of the population got, is, is what reduced the epidemic. Or maybe even the, maybe the, the, the water is no longer contaminated. So he was, he was honest. It was his heroic hero worshippers who made up this tale that he stayed the epidemic. Look, it's still a good story. It's still a good pump handle. I don't mind the metaphor, but just the truth was, you know? Now, this was the bigger, the bigger piece of the story, this comparison of Southwark and Vauxhall water in South London, which suffered very severely in the 54 epidemic. Now, the problem is that Southwark and Vauxhall supplied areas of London, like here and here, that were socioeconomically poor, considerably poor, than where Lambeth was. So if you saw a difference, in cholera rates, you might say, well, Lambeth, all those nice people, and they live in big houses, and they're on hills, which was important to Farr, who thought altitude made a difference. But you had this area that was intermixed. And Snow noticed that there's a place in London where all of the streets have water supplies from both companies. And it seems almost random, you know, who is 
you know, who's getting water. He called it his, the grand experiment. It's worth reading his words because this is a time where some, you see the scientific work, this anticipation of the randomized trial. No experiment could have been devised which would more thoroughly test the effect of water supply on the progress of cholera. No fewer than 300,000 people of both sexes, of every age and occupation, every rank and station, were divided into two groups. One group being supplied with water containing the sewage of London, and amongst it, whatever might have come from a cholera patient. That is so critical to snow. It's not just that it's sewage. It contains the cholera agent. And the other having water quite free from such impurity. This, uh, this, this mind that frames the experiment in his head, what we would now call a natural experiment, and the result was that, he, that in the intermixed district, the rate of cholera deaths, and this required a huge amount of work by Snow and his friends. He personally visited some 700 houses, inquired as to the water supply, uh, even did a chemical test on the water to see because the water from uh, closer to the Thames estuary is more saline, so he could precipitate uh, sodium. Uh, the, 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 rate, the, the rate ratio was 14.2 from his data. It's all deaths. He didn't have cases. And uh, that was really the more convincing part of the story. Now, why, how, you know, anesthesia and epidemiology are the poles apart, right? I mean, how many epidemiologists contemplated a career in anesthesiology? Any of you ever? Or how many anesthesiologists do epidemiology in their spare time? Not too common. So why? What is the link? Well, there are several linkages that I'd like to talk about today. First, there's no question that his skepticism of miasma had a lot to do with the fact that he knew tons more about gases than any of these sanitarians. They could talk about gas coming from here, vapors, emanations. He knew what he was talking about. And it's very clear that it was that which made him skeptical of the whole idea of emanations or vapors from rotting matter stimulated in some way by atmospheric conditions causing epidemics. He just couldn't see how these gases could act at a distance. And it turns out that it, this is what got him into trouble, his skepticism, as I said before, of airborne transmission. Not so much his argument, because the sanitarians could accept a dirty water argument. Not dirty water in the same sense snow meant it contaminated with cholera, but just dirty water was not good for you, like dirty air is not good for you. And you see repeated uh, statements by the sanitarians, what do we care whether it's from air or from water, it's bad for you. Dirt is bad. All filth is disease, as Chadwick so famously said. So, um, uh, but now I'm going to turn to, I think, this is one connection. I think it's an even deeper connection. And I think this unifying theme, uh, which actually was a little bit touched upon uh, before in some of the Paul's remarks, is, is, is encapsulated in one little phrase, and that phrase is mode of communication. I think this is the central idea in Snow's science, both in anesthesia and in um, and his cholera work. Um, uh, and, it, and, and let's consider the word communication, where we use it, as Paul said, in the word communicable diseases. But communication is a broader property than the communicable diseases, and probably applies to all diseases. All diseases are communicated, their ideology is communicated in some fashion. And, uh, uh, I think it, 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 it is an extraordinarily central part of, of Snow's thinking. Uh, and I also want you to think about the phrase that Frost used, chain of inference. Chain of inference. Uh, not just discovering facts, but a chain of inference. He used that all his cholera works use the phrase mode of communication, first edition, second edition, and also his article series which had the word pathology, which you remember was important to him in developing his theory. So he used this word. Now you might say, well, mode of communication. Surely everybody talked about the mode of communication of cholera. Actually, he was virtually unique in using this term. There's not a single 19th century book in English on cholera in the Welcome Historical Library near here. I checked it at home on the internet. I double-checked. I went to a librarian yesterday, had her run the search, there is no other book on cholera that uses, at least in English, that uses the term mode of communication anywhere in the 19th century. Not one. There's only one other book at all that uses the term mode of communication. Interestingly enough, to a perinatal person like myself, it's called On the Construction of the Placenta and the Mode of Communication Between the Mother and the Fetus in Utero. It's a diatribe against William Hunter's ideas about placentas. This guy, Francis Adams, who is, among other things, a great scholar of Greek, got it completely wrong. <laughs> William Hunter was right. 
Fascinatingly, the only two books that use the word mode of, mode of communication were both published in 1849 in London. Did they know each other? I don't know. He lived in Scotland, Francis Adams. It was not the focus. Mode of communication was not what people were interested in. At the mac there was a macro level, the sanitarians, weather, environment, big time, big picture, high level. There was the micro level. I, 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 in the interest of time, I, I, I can tell you more detail about that if you're interested. And I want there to be time for discussion. I think there will be based on the clock if I'm, if I'm moving at the right pace. Some investigators looked for the agent at the micro level. But Snow was in this kind of middle ground of looking for processes, processes that linked agent to host, that linked the agent to the host. In other words, investigating mode of communication. The only other person who really looked at mode of communication was our hero, von Pettenkoffer. He of the uh, cholera drink, uh, cholera cocktail. He had, but this was much later, the 1890s, an alternative mode of communication which required the cholera bacillus to sit in soil for a while and then get in. So therefore, water supplies were not a problem. And this had actually terribly deleterious impacts on the public health of Germany because epidemics of uh, cholera and typhoid were sustained in Germany for at least 30 or 40 years after they were eradicated from the English-speaking countries because snow was influential in England, eventually, not right away, and in, and in the United States as well. So I'm going to argue here that Snow taught us to think about mode of communication. We should think about mode of communication. You know, uh, all of you who have taken epi courses and teach epi courses have seen probably this triad, triad of analytic epidemiology. Host, agent, environment, right? There's a susceptible host, there's an agent of disease, and there's an environment in which they come together. Well, the environment in which they come together the processes that link agent to host are their modes of communication. I'm going to argue this is not restricted to infection. Snow somehow saw that. I'll define modes of communication as those processes that bring host and agent together in the real world. Those processes that bring host and agent together. Risk factors disease operate at different ecological levels. Society, neighborhood, family, individual, cell. The modes of communications are the connections between those levels, the, thing, the verbs that put those nouns together. And I think we can see mode of communication as a population level mechanism, analogous to a cellular mechanism. It's the mechanism that epidemiology should be interested in. Uh, well, mechanisms are very stable in the cell. Are the mechanisms, the mode of communication, is the mode of communication of a stable principle? Let me, let me show you something. This is a comparison of two epidemic curves of cholera. London, 1854. Haiti, 2010. Now, this one was just published in the New Journal a month ago. Now, if you look at this slide, you start off with a few scattered cases. It very rapidly rises to 100. This is 100 deaths a day in London, uh, summer of 1854. Then things creep up a little more slowly. Then suddenly there's another sharp spike and then a slow and steady decline. I want to show you severe disease, that's the purple in, in Haiti. Up we go, curl up, sharp increase, steady decline. Also over the same period of time, three months. 150 years in an ocean apart. There are some, I think what's happening, by the way, briefly, is I think what happens is, uh, maybe a little easy to see here, is that there's somehow uh, a few cases begin and somehow they contaminate a water supply. And then you go up. Why can't this? I can't seem to get this on the slide. All right, well, perhaps you can see it. Then a water supply is contaminated. Then there's person to person communication, which is slower. Then there are more people. Another water supply is going to find its home. And that, that big spike is the Broad Street outbreak. There must, there's another Broad Street outbreak in Haiti. We don't call it the Broad Street outbreak, but something very much like that happened in Haiti uh, in, in 2010. I think there are advantages to think of modes of communication, disease control. Host, agent, or static modes of communication are dynamic. Host and agents are noun modes of communication of verbs. This dynamic property offers multiple opportunities for disease prevention. And in the historic control of infections, it's been much more important to know the mode of communication than 
the agent. This is what uh, Peter told us about AIDS. If you knew the mode of communication, you could prevent it before you identified the agent. That's, in fact, what happened. Uh, and they extend beyond infectious disease, as I'll talk about in a moment. In fact, I think, Snow studied the mode of communication of anesthetics. Because prior to Snow, people talked about agents. They talked about chloroform. They talked about ether. They talked about specific agents. Snow realized that anesthetic delivery was an entire process. And I think what he worked out was the mode of communication of anesthetics. Uh, his interest was on in human processes always. Look at the titles of his books. And I see, on the inhalation, he focuses on the human process involved, inhalation of vapor, narcotism by the inhalation of vapors. His last book reverts to the noun, on chloroform and on other anesthetics. Did he change his thinking? Keep in mind that he never finished the book. He died while writing it. His friend Benjamin Ward Richardson finished it, and I think titled it, though I don't know that for sure. Here's the process that Snow worked out. First, prepare the right gas ether mixture. Then deliver the anesthetic, the agent, to the host by a mask. Monitor the patient. He was the first to insist that someone other than the surgeon must provide anesthesia. Someone has to keep an eye on the patient. The surgeon can't be keeping an eye on the patient. The first to develop a scale of narcotism, of how deeply in anesthesia. One, two, three, four, five. Don't get to five. Don't do one. In one, it's painful. In five, the patient's going to be dead soon. Two, three, four. And he described these. And then keep very careful records. So you can, you can work out the side effects, the complication rates, and so forth. And we have three volumes of his case books published. And you can see the meticulous, careful records he kept. And then he used summary tables to give rates of complications uh, by anesthetic <coughs> agents in his, in his anesthesia work. Just to argue that mode of communication, not agent identification, was the key to the historical conquest of infectious diseases. You know, we think now we're in a great age of biology and science. The last quarter of the... 20th century, we've been part of, most of us, right? How many great discoveries do you make between 1973 and 2000? Can they compare to what was discovered between 1873 and 1900, the last quarter of the 19th century? These were the agents of disease identified correctly in the final quarter of the 19th century. Isn't one extraordinary period in this history of science. Have we ever come close to that? Most the specific agents, causes of virtually, of, of that time, the vast majority of deaths in the world were identified in that 25-year period. Syphilis was one of the big things that came a little bit later. Also, typhus. So they improved public health, right? Knowing that? Well, what did we have prior to 1900 that worked on agents? We had the antitoxins of von Behring to Santa, for which von Behring won the Nobel Prize. There was a kind of weekly active typhoid fever vaccine by uh, Sir Al Roth Wright, usually called Sir Almost Wright. Uh, between 1900 and 1930, we had some antibacterial vaccines. BCG came to the fore, diphtheria tetanus. They were not fully 100% effective. The first anti malaria was in 1925. It took until the 30s till we had anything to actually combat an agent, the sulfonylamides, 1937, penicillin, 42. Uh, uh, streptomycin, the first anti-tuberculous drug, 1948, <coughs> discovered by Selman Waxman in New Jersey. 66 years after, after the tubercle bacillus was identified. 66 years between the agent and the treatment for the agent. On the other hand, on the other side, meanwhile, back at the ranch, we epidemiologists, or our proto-epidemiologists of the 19th century, were observing that you could interrupt physical transmission of some kind of an agent, we don't know what it is, between uh, women or between dead women and live women when you're delivering them by rinsing your hands with chloride of lime. Samuel Weiss's contribution. And of course, the fecal oral mode of transmission. Snow discovered, first person to describe the fecal oral mode, but also Bud, who you've mentioned already, did the same for cholera. By that means, without knowing the agent at that time, it proved possible to protect water supplies and save millions of lives. End of cholera epidemics by the 1860s, not in Germany. People should read Death in Hamburg, 
of the epidemic of 1895, when just classically, right, the whole depth was just divided. Hamburg and Alt, Altdorf is at the next door town, divided by water supply. All the deaths here, none of the deaths here. 10,000 died. 1895. This did not happen anymore in England or the USA, but they didn't listen to snow. And very importantly, arthropod transmission was worked out again without necessarily knowing the agent. Yellow fever, a viral agent not identified until the 1930s. But in Havana, using Walter Reed's principles, Gorgas actually went from 1,500 deaths in the summer of 1899 to zero deaths in the summer of 2000 by mosquito control. Extraordinary. He prefigured, by the way, what was done in the smallpox campaign. He, he created circles of immunity around uh, cases. Panama Canal could not have been constructed until yellow fever and malaria control, through, again, through mosquito control. And uh, in, when Charles Nicole discovered that lice were the vector of typhus, uh, it was possible to, to reduce that great disease of the army's typhus. All of this without necessarily having any knowledge of the agent, without any knowledge of host susceptibility, without knowing the human genome even. Can you imagine? <laughs> How about in contemporary epidemiology? Uh, smoking is to me a mode of communication. It's a complex behavior acquired in certain ways, transmitted in certain ways. There's an agent in cigarette smoke that kills us. We have no idea what it is. I'm not going to spend much money on trying to find out what it is. You could, if you were interested in the agent. Or you could work a lot on host susceptibility to smoking-related diseases. You could. But you could also work on the mode of communication of this agent. I understand, as Peter Pure said, if you look at the recommendations of the CDC for control of AIDS before the virus was identified, it was only one year or two years, they said condom use, blood transfusions, it was all there. Now, of course, we elaborate when we know the agent. We can get antibodies. We can do a lot of things. But the core elements of prevention are there without the agent and without the host. Uh, tampon use, as tampon use became, uh, that behavior became common, so we, got, we found that it could be a vehicle, certain parts of the processing, a vehicle for toxic shock syndrome. Again, we identified that mode of transmission before we know the agent. And even sleep position. Sleep position is a social behavior. It's transmitted in certain ways. It's culturally acquired. And it matters to the rate of death from sudden infant death syndrome. We have no idea why. He tells us a pediatrician, we don't know why. We have some thoughts, but we don't really know. Modes of communication. I want to give you one concrete example from courtesy of my colleague Jim Anthony about cannabis dependence. This is one example he works on drug dependence. He looks at the mode of communication of cannabis. He separates the process of becoming cannabis dependent to three steps. How likely is someone to be offered the opportunity to try the drug, right? Nobody is a cannabis dependent who has not been offered the opportunity to try cannabis, right? If you're offered the opportunity, how likely are you to, to use it? And third, if you used it, how likely are you to become dependent? By the way, work has been done on cigarette smoking like this. Work has been done on drug addiction. I'm just giving you one example. Does it separate? Do people fall into different categories so you can target your interventions? Yes, here's one simple example. Based on national surveys in the United States, population-wide surveys, in this survey, slightly higher exposure opportunity for, for males to females. Okay? If you're offered, do you use identical between males and females? However, the separation begins later are you going to become dependent? So if your strategy, if you thought males were at risk, your strategy would not focus on the issue of exposure opportunity. You, you would focus on what happened, you'd focus on the, the already using population. From other data that I'm not going to show, Jim tells me that one of the principal differences between drug use in urban American ghettos and suburbs is the first step, opportunity to be offered. Once the first step is there, the rates are similar. So here's an example of taking this mode of communication of cannabis, breaking it down, the process, just like Snow did for color, I think, and looking at the places where you can intervene. And that's why I think Snow was so far ahead of the game and so useful to us. So 
In summary, I think he was the first biomedical scientist to introduce the concept of auto-communication into thinking about the, the distribution of disease. He set an example for what to prioritize in epidemiologic research and what to set aside. He did not focus on agent identification. Several people did. He did not worry about host characteristics, which several people worried about. What is it about the poor? Is there alcohol? Is there diet? Is there things like that? Weather patterns. He didn't attend to that. And the history of infectious diseases emphasizes that while microbial agent discoveries are great, and I'm sure we're going to find things about host susceptibility, the public health advances have come from understanding and controlling the modes of communication. And I think we can profit from these lessons. Thank you very much, and I really would like to have questions.